Hello, everyone. Welcome to the February 2024 presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History, your host today. These monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with support from the New Mexico History Museum and from donations from our audience. Today, we are happy to welcome Nick Pappas. Nick worked for four decades in the newspaper industry, most recently as an editor at the Albuquerque Journal. He has written news stories, columns, and award-winning editorials, as well as freelance articles for magazines. Prior to the journal, he spent nearly 24 years at the Telegraph of Nashua, New Hampshire, where he served at different times as business editor, city editor, managing editor, editor-in-chief, and editorial page editor. He was named an Editorial Writer of the Year by the New England Newspaper and Press Association in both 2009 and 2011, and he was recognized by the New Hampshire Press Association with its Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011. A native of Lowell, Massachusetts, he now lives with his wife, Susan, in Albuquerque. Today, Nick will speak on the tragic story of Dawson, New Mexico, and its twin mining disasters in the first half of the 20th century. It is a remarkable story of the rise, decline, and ultimate disappearance of a major mining town in New, New Mexico, and of the strong bonds of the descendants of many of the former town's mining families and their ties to Dawson's historic cemetery which has been a National Historic Landmark since 1992. As the talks proceed, we encourage you, the audience, to ask questions. Just use the chat box below your YouTube video screen. We will respond to your queries uh, following the lecture. Thank you for your continued interest in these presentations. And now, let us welcome Nick Pappas. Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking Ben Grant and the Friends of History for the opportunity to speak here today about my new book, Crosses of Iron, The Tragic History of Dawson, New Mexico and Its Twin Mining Disasters, which was published this past October by the University of New Mexico Press. But before I do, I want to take a moment to explain what led this longtime New Englander to begin research on a book about an old coal town that hasn't been around for nearly three quarters of a century. As you might suspect then, I had never heard of Dawson until shortly after my wife Susan and I moved here from Southern New Hampshire in the summer of 2013 so I could accept an editor's job, assistant editor's job at the Albuquerque Journal. As it turns out, that October happened to coincide with the 100 year anniversary of what still stands today as the second deadliest mine disaster in US history. 263 miners lost their lives in that 1913 incident. That occasion was marked by major news stories in my paper and others, as well as a memorial service at Dawson Cemetery, organized by the Greek philanthropic organization, the Ahepa. On that day, several priests presided over a graveside service that included the reading of names of not only the 263 men killed in the 1913 mine disaster, but also the 120 who were killed in an explosion a decade earlier. Well, I didn't realize it at the time, my introduction into these two events started me on a journey that would culminate 10 years later with the publication of Crosses of Iron, a narrative account of this snake-bitten coal town whose fascinating history I came to understand encompasses far more than these two tragic events. For starters, there is the story of the early history of the land that dates back to 1841. That's when the Mexican government conveyed a leaf-shaped 1.7 million acre tract of land to two Mexican citizens in what would become known as the Maxwell Land Grant the largest such grant in U.S. history. In time, owner Lucian Maxwell would sell the entire tract to a group of men backed by an English syndicate for $1.35 million, but not before selling a tiny slice in 1869 
to a 39-year-old Arkansas-born rancher that years later would bear his name. There's a story of the prominent role played by immigrants from Europe, part of the massive wave of European immigration between 1880 and 1920 that brought 20 million people to America. There is a story of the emergence of Dawson as a model company town, one largely unmatched by coal camps, not just in the Southwest, but in the nation as a whole. There is the story of the rise of the American labor movement and its impact on Dawson during the 1930s and 1940s. There is the story of the abrupt closing of the town in 1950, when the remaining residents were given but three months notice to pack up all their belongings and leave. There is the story of the rediscovery, if you will, of Dawson Cemetery by two brothers some 40 years later that led to its placement on the National Register of Historic Places. And for me, perhaps the most remarkable of all, it's the story of how the Dawson community is still alive today, still gathering every other year for a picnic reunion on the old town site to reminisce and celebrate all things Dawson. But first, Dawson is a coal town that had only been around for four years when U.S. Mine Inspector Joey e. Sheridan made this statement in 1905, quote, this property at Dawson is going to be one of the greatest coal properties in the country, end quote. As it turns out, Mr. Sheridan also was quite struck by the property itself. Here he is waxing poetic about the Dawson landscape in that year's annual mine inspectors report. Quote, on either hand are seen orchards which in spring fill the air with the fragrance of their blossoms and in the fall are laden with luscious fruits while the prevailing gentle winds come down the canyon, pregnant with perfume of pines, which adorn the eroded canyons and the tabletop sandstone hills upon all sides. Now, while Sheridan may have missed his true calling as a man of letters, he knew mining. In fact, it wouldn't be long before Dawson emerged as one of the dominant coal producers in the New Mexico territory and beyond. The American Southwest had no shortage of mythical characters during its rise in the 19th century and what would become the largest company town in the New Mexico territory and actually all of the Southwest had its own ultimate namesake, John Barkley Dawson. Pioneer, rancher, farmer, cattle driver, trailblazer, Texas Ranger, patriarch, three-time married father of nine, but no coal baron. Dawson was far more interested in using the coal found scattered about his property to fuel his wood stove during those frigid New Mexico winter nights than to lay the groundwork for a major mining company. Besides, ranching and cattle driving were his true loves. This was evident as early as 1855, when the then 25-year-old and his associates drove a herd of several hundred cattle over 2,000 danger-filled miles from Arkansas to California to sell to miners for food during the cold rush. Later, he would do the same when gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and in time, a version of this route would become known as the Dawson Trail. But not all of Dawson's adventures were by his own choosing. In 1892, the Maxwell Land Grant Company filed a land ejectment suit against him, eager to gain access to the vast deposits of coal underlying the 20,000 acres of land that Dawson had claimed for his own. At issue, a handshake deal he had entered with Lucian Maxwell some 23 years earlier that resulted in a deed that was a head scratcher even by 19th century standards. Quote, all the land, the ground, are now suitable for farming or cultivating purposes in the valley of drainage of the Ramejo River, County of Mora, Territory of New Mexico, within the following boundaries, to wit. Beginning at a certain dam at the head of a certain ditch at the right-hand point of rocks. From thence, running down on the north side of the river to a certain other pile of rocks on a knoll or elevation with some bushes thereto. Thence, 
running very near southward across said river to a pinyon tree to the right of a ridge near a wash, which tree is marked with the letter L. Thence, running up said river on the south side to the place of the beginning, containing about blank acres, more or less, unquote. Yet, after a lengthy four-year legal battle that made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, Dawson won the right to retain his property, indecipherable deed and all. Nevertheless, Dawson soon realized it was only a matter of time before his property would be mined for coal. So in 1901, five years after his court victory, Dawson agreed to sell all but 1,200 acres and all mineral rights for $450,000 to a railroad promoter named Charles Eddy and what would become the Dawson Fuel Company. Eddie's first order of business was building a 132-mile rail connection between the Dawson coal fields and the town of Tucumcari, where the Chicago, Rock Island, Pacific Railroad provided access to out-of-state markets to the Midwest. Dawson Fuel deserves credit for laying the foundation for what would come years later, building the necessary structures to support a coal town, as well as hundreds of homes for its growing workforce. By the time Dawson Fuel sold the mines in 1905, it had established a crew of 650 men capable of producing 423,000 tons of coal, the second highest in the New Mexico Territory. Phelps Dodge and Company, the buyer, was founded in New York in 1834 as an import-export company specializing in copper and metals. But by the end of the century, it had broadened its business to become the owner of several copper mines in southeastern Arizona, which were dependent on a steady stream of coke, a pure form of coal, to fuel its copper smelters. And after experiencing some reliability issues with its suppliers, Phelps Dodge entered into an agreement with Eddie in 1905 to purchase the Dawson Fuel Company, its four railroads, and a lumber company for 16 million, or roughly 500 million in today's inflation adjusted dollars. Despite the heavy price, Phelps Dodge was thrilled with the purchase, said Dr. James Douglas, who helped negotiate the sale and would soon become president of the company, quote, the coal mine itself can supply all the coal needed for the next hundred years. We have a blanket of coal at least five feet thick, extending in one direction for 10 miles and in the other eight miles, unquote. Now to tell Doc to call Dawson a coal camp would be a misnomer, or as someone once wrote, doing so in the presence of a Dawsonite would assure, quote, trouble aplenty. And with good reason. Among Dawson's rather unusual amenities, a 1,000 seat opera house, the largest theater in the territory at the time, complete with the ballroom, billiard hall, bowling alley, and many other amenities. A three-story mercantile store, measuring some 15,000 square feet at, that supplied pretty much everything a Dawson resident might need. And if that weren't enough, the store sent buyers to New York to check out and purchase the latest in men's and women's fashions, which the store then showcased with fashion shows using live models. A brand new hospital built in 1906, of which it was said, quote, there is not a more modern and up-to-date institution of this class to be found in the West, unquote. The 32-bed hospital had two wards, one surgical, one medical, a well-equipped operating room, the latest at x-ray equipment, a trained staff of doctors, doctors and nurses, and if needed, an ambulance service consisting of saddle horses so doctors could respond to the emergency calls. There were four schools, including a new high school built in 1921 that is believed to be the only accredited high school in a coal town in all of New Mexico. Other amenities included athletic fields, a gymnasium, two churches, an outdoor swimming pool, and even a golf course at the time recognized as the highest elevation course in the country at 6,700 feet. 
For a time, Dawson even had a newspaper, even though it was more a company house organ than an independent source of news. By 1910, 75% of the workers employed underground were from Europe, the vast majority Italians, Slavs, and Greeks. In fact, Italians alone made up 40% of the underground workers and about one third of those employed outside the mines that year. Among the other European countries represented, Austria, Finland, France, Germany, Great Britain, Hungary, Ireland, Poland, Scotland, and Sweden. Here they were joined by Americans, Spanish-speaking natives of Mexico and New Mexico, and others from as far as China and Russia. Given that, Dawson mine owners found it necessary to post safety signs in numerous languages around the mines to accommodate its diverse population. In time, the town's ethnic breakdown would change. By 1920, 10 years later, Mexicans at 46% had surpassed Italians as the dominant group inside the mines, followed by Americans, Slavs, and Greeks. For some Americans, I'm sorry, for some immigrants, the plan was to stay a few years, send some money home to their families, and perhaps even return to the old country. Some would leave and come back, accompanied by friends and relatives. Still others would remain to start a new life here in America. It didn't take long for New Mexico miners to learn the truth about the dangers of their profession. The first recorded fatal mine accident in the territory occurred in 1894, when a falling rock crushed the back of a worker digging coal at the White Ash Mine in Cerrillos. A year later, that mine was the setting for the territory's first full-fledged mine disaster, which the federal government defined as an incident that claimed the lives of five or more men. In what one newspaper called the White Ash Mine Horror, 24 men were killed in a gas explosion on February 27, 1895. Yet, while mine explosions would earn attention of newspapers in this country and abroad, the reality was miners were far more likely to, be, to die under much less newsworthy circumstances. Among them, fallen cola rock, being run over by mine cars, electrocution, suffocation, misuse of binding machines, and other causes. In fact, between the years 1870 and 1912, fewer than one in five miners died in accidents, resulting from gas explosions, coal dust blasts, or underground fires. By all measures, 1900 to 1909 was the deadliest decade for American coal miners. During this period, 157 miners, mine disasters, claimed the lives of 3,932 men. The five worst accounted for nearly one third of all the deaths. 362 in Monongo, West Virginia in 1907. 259 in Cherry, Illinois in 1909, 239 in Jacobs Creek, Pennsylvania in 1907, 200 in Schofield, Utah in 1900, 184 in Cold Creek, Tennessee in 1902. Sadly, Dawson would join this group just a few years later. But it would be another 80 years before the explosive properties of coal dust. The inherent dangers of coal dust were suspected as far back as 1803, when an explosion at a mine in Walsend, England, claimed the lives of 13 men and boys. But it would be another 80 years before the explosive properties of coal dust were accepted as a matter of science. That year, a study published by two British mine inspectors found that coal dust was, quote, the effective agent in most of the great mine explosions. In the United States, one of the earliest coal mine explosions where dust was considered a factor took place in 1884 at the Pocahontas Mine in West Virginia, where all 114 men were killed. 
a committee established by the American Institute of Mining Engineers determined the explosion was due mainly to dust. In New Mexico, the first official reference leaking coal dust to a mine explosion occurred nearly two decades later in 1901, when three men were killed in a Gallup mine. Newspaper reports at the time detailed the extreme force of the blast, quote, the iron doors weighing 1,000 pounds and several pit cars were blown out onto the tipple, the Albuquerque Weekly Citizen reported. The shaft was ruined. The 40-foot frame chimney above it was reduced to kindling wood. That explosion prompted U.S. Mine Inspector Joey Sheridan to send a letter to the two dozen mining companies then operating in New Mexico, pointing out what happens in Gallup and the importance of keeping the accumulation of coal dust under control. 11 years later, the Dawson mine owners received a similar warning from mine inspector Reese Beto after observing, quote, a great accumulation of slack coal and dust. That later was dated 10 months before the first of Dawson's two major mine disasters. That Dawson would become the site of not only one, but two major mine explosions came as a shock to those familiar with the industry. That's because ever since Phelps Dodge acquired the mines in 1905, Dawson had earned a national reputation for safety in the training of its workers and the latest technological advancements. This became evident as early as 1910, when Phelps Dodge built what was described as a second to none rescue station, where men equipped with the rudimentary breathing apparatuses of the day maneuvered through set fires and noxious fumes in a simulation of what they would face in the what they would face in the event of a real explosion. In fact, Dawson's reputation for safety was such that when the U.S. Bureau of Mines staged a coal dust explosion a year later at its experimental mine outside of Pittsburgh, Dawson's rescue team was one of two chosen from around the country to inspect the mine after that controlled blast. Nevertheless, on October 22, 1913, Dawson suffered what still stands today as the second deadliest blast in U.S. history. Shortly after 3 p.m. on that day, an unidentified miner set off an explosive intended to loosen coal while he and 283 others were inside the mine, a violation of both state law and company regulations. In those days, miners, most miners were paid by the ton, so the more coal dislodged from, dislodged from the coal bed and placed in a mine cart for weighing, the higher the miners' wages. In this case, however, the blasting powder was set improperly. Instead of blowing into the wall to dislodge the coal, it blew out into the mine, igniting the coal dust and setting off a major explosion. Of the 284 men at the time of the inside the mine at the time of the explosion, only 23 survived. A decade later, on February 8, 1923, tragedy struck again. This time, the coal dust was ignited when some electric mine cars ran off the track, knocking down the trolley wires that arced after touching the outside of the iron cars. Of the 122 men inside the mine at the time, only two survived, miraculously walking out of the mine the next morning, 16 hours after the explosion. The two miners, a Greek and an Italian, had the presence of mind to dip the bottom of their sweaters in water to shield their faces from the deadly gases until ventilation inside the mine was restored. With the loss of 383 men in the 1913 and 1923 explosions, Dawson holds the unwanted distinction as the only mining town in America to suffer two disasters of this magnitude. Dawson would recover and remain in operation for nearly another 30 years, but average employment and annual coal production would never again reach the record set in 1915 and 1916, respectively. There are a number of outside reasons for this, not the least of which was the arrival of the Great Depression in the 1930s, where annual coal production would fall 40% over a three-year period. For its part, 
much like after the 1913 disaster, Dawson became even more obsessed with safety, working with state official and industry leaders to adopt practices that would lessen the likelihood of another major explosion. And indeed, the 1923 mine disaster would be its last. The United Mine Workers of America formed in 1890 to fight for good wages and safe workplaces for its members, relying at times on regional and national strikes to achieve these goals. After Dawson Miners chartered a local under the UMWA in 1933, they became a regular participant in the national coal strikes of the 1930s and 1940s, called by the group's charismatic leader, John L. Lewis. In 1935, after the UMWA and the nation's coal operators reached agreement on a new contract after an eight-day nationwide strike, a funny thing happened. The Dawson miners refused to return to work unless Phelps Dodge formally recognized their union and the desire for a union contract. Phelps Dodge had no tolerance for unions. Instead, it announced it would shut the mine for good unless they returned by a certain date. The second time in two years, the company had threatened to do so. The workers did return after a three-week strike. It would be another eight years before Phelps Dodge agreed to recognize the union, and another two before the Dawson local entered into its first contract with the company in 1945. That agreement, so long in the making, would come five years before the closing of the town. By the late 1940s, the future of Dawson was very much in jeopardy. A 1948 drilling program intended to find new reserves of clean coal proved unsuccessful. Waste rock was making up more and more of the coal being mined. Miners had to travel three to four miles from the mine portal just to reach the coal beds. And Dawson miners continued to participate in repeated labor strikes right up through 1949. And perhaps worst of all, Dawson's primary customer for coal, the Southern Pacific Railroad, was replacing its coal burning locomotives with diesel engines. Around that time, the railroad accounted for about 60 to 65% of uh, all of Dawson's customers, all of Dawson's coal. The end came quickly with little warning in early 1950. The final day of coal production would be April 28, and the town would shut down for good on June 30. Six days later, Phelps Dodge sold all of its above-ground holdings to an Arizona salvage firm for $500,000 to begin dismantling the town piece by piece. Some 40 years later, when the last of the Dawson residents had scattered around the country, two brothers happened to come across Dawson Cemetery while on a metal detecting trip in Colfax County. Dale and Lloyd Christian knew enough of the town's history to suspect they might find some remnants of the old mining town but they didn't expect to come across a large abandoned cemetery with its sea of white iron crosses, nearly 400 in all. Quote, we were both shocked at the cemetery. It looked like a miniature Arlington, Dale told a newspaper columnist after his visit. It contained row upon row of white iron crosses. It appeared to be abandoned and uncared for. Dale brought the discovery to the attention of New Mexico officials and suggested they apply to get the cemetery listed on the National Register of the Historic Places. He volunteered to help, providing measurements, photographs, and some historical research to be used in the state's official application. And despite strict criteria governing the inclusion of cemeteries on the National Register, Dawson Cemetery was accepted on April 9. 1992. Today, nearly three quarters of a century after the town ceased to exist, Dawson lives on in the hearts and minds of those who once lived and worked there, called it home, and dutifully passed down their memories to their children and their grandchildren. 
The Dawson, New Mexico Association hosts a website chock full of history, photographs, videos, and other material, while a private Dawson Facebook page can count nearly 800 members. But perhaps the first sign that the community would endure occurred in 1954, four years after its closing, when dozens of former residents gathered for a reunion 1,000 miles away in Pasadena. California would host some more Dawson reunions around that state in the 1970s before they moved to New Mexico. The first reunion on the old Dawson town site took place in 1980, where they have taken place every year on Labor Day, week on Labor Day weekend. Here they share stories, display mementos, exchange photographs, and relive memories of what it once meant to be a Dawsonite. Last summer, just shy of 600 people from across the country turned out for the first reunion since 2018 after COVID-19 restrictions had forced the cancellation of plans for 2020 and a makeup date in 2021. Given the passage of time, that's a remarkable turnout. Or looked at another way, the number of people who attended last year was equal to half the town's 1,200 population when the town closed in 1950. Among the attendees last year were Dolores Huerta and three of her children. Ms. Huerta, a celebrated American labor leader and Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, was born in Dawson in 1930, the daughter of a coal miner and a homemaker. But halfway through her second grade year, between Christmas and New Year's Day, she told me, she moved to Stockton, California with her mother and siblings after her parents separated. This was her third reunion. And for anyone who thought she might have mellowed as a now 93 year old, you should have heard her Sunday afternoon address at the reunion. That brings to a close today's presentation on Dawson, New Mexico and Crosses of Iron, my narrative history of this beloved old coal town. I want to thank the Friends of History for the opportunity to be a part of this wonderful program and each of you for your interest in learning about this nearly forgotten chapter of New Mexico history. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your analysis and insights on the Phelps Dodge coal mines in Dawson, New Mexico, uh, and its importance as one of the major coal mining towns in the Southwest. Uh, I, I have to say your presentation was was so fine. I find myself struggling to uh, find a question to ask, but I'll, I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't help but being struck by how the history of the company town of Dawson and of the, the business embodies a clear snapshot of the history of coal mining in, in New Mexico and more broadly throughout the West, a story of boom and bust. And the story also offers, seems to offer clear insights into the strong bonds of, of community, which developed among many of the town's mining families, inter inter interpersonal bonds, which still continue today, as, as so aptly demonstrated in your final slide. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's anything further you might want to share in terms of the inter and the personal uh, uh, relationships that developed for uh, you developed in researching this and in um, what it uh, how it reflected in in, in your work uh, for this uh, fine book only the, only that it became clear really early on um, in my research um, and in speaking to some of the Dawson folks um, just what the community still meant to them, again, three quarters of a century after the town closed. Um, very early on, um, one of the um, a Dawson native who lives in Raton, um, he and his wife were nice enough to open up their kitchen to me, and they um, gathered about seven or eight um, other Dawson folks um, for a basically a kitchen table interview so I could get my first sense of um, what Dawson was like. And in just listening to them, just, you know, interact with myself, interact with each other, um, it just became immediately clear to me at that point that there was this was something special, um, that this town still uh, meant a great, great deal to them and the relationships that they, they forged there. 
Uh, we, you know, in fact, there was one gentleman who later told me that, you know, if he had lived in Dawson his entire life, he would have been fine with that, um, which I think demonstrated just how these people felt about it. So we sat around this table for about two hours. Um, I asked a bunch of questions. Um, you know, everyone had nothing but great things to say about their time in Dawson. Um, the, the ownership of Phelps Dodge. Um, so right before we wrapped up, I just kind of stopped everything and said, look, we've been here for about two hours and I haven't heard a bad word about Dawson, about Phelps Dodge. I mean, it, there had to be, you know, there had to be some, you know, bad times here or some negatives here. And I remember one of the women you know, looking at me straight in the eyes and saying, and you never will. And that pretty much summed up for me um, what would be demonstrated over the next three years of my research um, into the book um, of this incredible love that these folks still have um, for the town, um, for themselves and the relationships that they forge there. Uh -huh. Your yeah, last comment is is really quite quite touching, and particularly when you recognize this was a large corporation, and uh, uh, toward the end, as things had declined with the mine, um, the uh, the end of Dawson uh, was quite was quite abrupt. But uh, to balance that against uh, the feelings of uh, uh, family and community, which seem to be have been reflected in in the discussions that you had with have had with uh, uh, descendants and those who lived there early on that are still alive today um, uh, is really quite meaningful. Uh, I find Phelps Dobbs uh, throughout the early days of, the, of Dawson demonstrated a sincere effort to develop and sustain a high quality of life for the miners. And, by, and while it cr and created a, on its own a model town with fine housing, entertainment facilities, state-of-the-art medical facilities. Your graphic there with, uh, of the buildings, I think, reflects very, very well. Uh, it also, I also noted that the pho photographs were just, were just uh, excellent in terms of helping us to, to really grasp uh, a sense of, of, the, of the town itself and of the mine and, and uh, uh, where, where these, these folks lived. Um, I also uh, was struck by how Phelps Dodge sought to employ the, you know, the most modern, uh, of at least for its times, of mining techniques and to establish a strong program of safety education, which encouraged active miner participation. Although the company town approach to labor relations, uh, first introduced, I believe, by the Pullman Rail, Rail Car Company, uh, is no longer viable. This paternalistic approach to labor relations is so reflective of the early years of the 20th century and did seem to benefit in varying degrees, both the company and its employees in the early years in Dawson. Uh, regrettably, the efforts were undone by human error and the industry-wide lack, uh, industry lack of a clear understanding of the true dangers of coal mining. Um, for which, for which, you know, which uh, regrettably led to those two major, major d d disasters. Uh, so, um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that further, or uh, yeah, only that this. you know that is one of the major ironies that you had this um, community, this coal town, um, led by Phelps Dodge at that time that took safety very, very seriously and trained its workers and, um, you know, beyond the rescue station that I, uh, formation of the rescue station in 1910, I believe that I mentioned, um, they constantly ran first aid classes. Um, they had a annual um, event, I believe in the fall, almost like a field day where they had numerous contests that were all, um, you know, pretty much set up around safety issues um, to, uh, they had contests and they gave away prizes and they gave away first aid patches. Um, and they, it really was something ingrained in the, um, in the, in the company and, um, and, and among the people who work there, but still, even with that, um, you had these, you know, these two incidents um, you know, that, you know, basically put 
Dawson on the on the map, both nationally and internationally. Um, and so it, it it is one of the one of the uh, I guess sad ironies of the um, of the story of Dawson and its history. Well, thank you, Nick, once again for your informative analysis into the town of Dawson, its people, and its unique place in New Mexico history. In the process, you've broadened, I think, all of our understanding of this lesser known aspect of the state's history. For our audience, should you have any questions, feel free to use the chat window below this YouTube site. We will address them after the presentation. If you would like to purchase Nick's book, Crosses of Iron, the tragic story of Dawson, New Mexico, and its twin mining disasters. It is available through the University of New Mexico Press at the website below. And through your favorite bookstore, uh, you could check out bookshop.org. In closing, a reminder to all to check out the Friends of History webpage, where you can find this uh, lecture again to watch as well as other First Wednesday lectures covering a wide range of historical topics about New Mexico. And do come back to the webpage to learn about our upcoming 2024 topics in the First Wednesday lecture series, and more broadly, about the Friends of History itself. We, you can join our mailing list either via the webpage or by e emailing us at uh, the Gmail uh, address below. Finally, consider making a donation, however small, so that we can continue to provide these informative lectures throughout the year. We are most appreciative and thank you for your support. We look forward to seeing you in the months ahead. Goodbye for now.